Okay, so so even if you miss the class, I hope you catch up with the uh, videos. So last time we talked about supermassive stars and um, how they're going to burn everything up to iron. Now, when you're going to have iron building up in the core as ashes, so silicon is going to burn into iron. Okay. Once the iron reaches like a certain mass, it will never fuse. It will just, uh, gravity is going to squeeze the core. Okay. And then the outside here is going to bounce off. Okay. So because it's going to change the size, it's going to keep the same rotation as before because all stars are rotating. But you know, it's called conservation of angular momentum. As the star gets smaller, it's going to spin crazy, crazy, crazy fast. Okay? It's going to increase the speed of rotation. Okay. In addition to that, all that will go bada boom in a supernova type two. And what will be left behind could be a neutron star or a black hole. So let's talk about neutron star. So you see, um, you could have a white dwarf with less massive stars. So in that case, and that's always a question on the final, uh, it will be held by electron degeneracy. So gravity try to squeeze, you know, the remnant, like that will happen to our sun. And the electrons, because they don't like to be close to each other, they're going to fight back. So it will be held by electron degeneracy. But if gravity, if the core is much, much heavier, okay, gravity, electron degeneracy is not enough. Gravity pulls, keep pulling everything together up to the point when proton electron gonna merge together. And send me an email also if you want extra credit. So protons and electrons merge together, and that will give you neutron. That's how we get a neutron star plus neutrinos. Neutrinos are ghost particles. Yes, they go through your brain like every second, all the time, but they don't interact with matter, so it's not that bad. Okay, so I have a few videos about neutron stars because it's super interesting. It's still not fully understood what's happening inside, but before that, I just remember, just right now, I wanted to show you that last time and I forgot. Uh, that was April 8th, the 8th, and that's a picture taken by NASA. It's an amazing picture. Uh, you can really see here the details. So you have the moon, okay, and in just in front of the sun. And what you see here, it's... Um, it's the corona. So you see the, the outside, the, the outside uh, of, of the sun, it's called the corona. So it's like plasma and you have, you can kind of imagine the solar wind okay, pushing away all those particles. So that's why we are lucky to have a magnetic field to protect us against that solar wind. But it's an amazing picture. So interestingly, the reason why the moon can totally eclipse the sun is that you have an interesting ratio. So that means the sun okay, is exactly 400 times the size of the moon and the distance between Earth and the sun is 400 times the distance between Earth and the moon. Okay, So it's like a similar triangle. So because of that amazing ratio, you can have eclipses. It's a very interesting. Uh, fact. So that's a beautiful picture. Uh, that's that's a short video, and it was it was taken in Long Island. You see how the moon, as it moves around the uh, the Earth, okay, it's eclipsing the Earth, uh, the Sun. It's like a bite. So an eclipse will only take seven minutes. Okay, it's very short. So you really have to be prepared. So taking a bite of the sun and then here it's not totally total eclipse but not uh, not far from that 
So it's twinkling because of the atmosphere of the earth, right? We talk about the twinkling. And now it's moving away. It's quite very impressive that we have learned so much. We know so much how it works. But that's known since 2000 years, right? The Greek, they knew, they understood what was going on. And that's a student of mine, but I forgot who. Maybe in this class, no? It's none of you. Someone sent me this picture, but I forgot who. Um, so that was in Miami. So you see, you don't have the total eclipse, but it's a partial eclipse. Okay, that was still impressive. It's like very fascinating. There are a lot of things fascinating about eclipses. If you have a total eclipse, you you will. Uh, so first of all, it's not totally dark. It's some kind of very strange night, that kind of gray. And the animals are totally confused. So the birds will stop uh, singing. The, the sheep, for example, <laughs> will start to fall asleep for seven minutes. Uh, so I guess it's a power nap. So very interesting. OK, so that I forgot to show you. So now I have a video. Uh, so I found this video. So I hope I won't get in trouble because sometimes I get uh, strikes. Um, but it's for education purpose, OK? My channel, of course, is not monetized. But um, that channel is named Socracia. Socracia. And in this short video, she talked about the fresh hold of masses. Okay, so for example, for a white dwarf, you don't want to go over 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Question on the final. Okay, it's a Chandra Sekar limit. For a neutron star, you don't want to go over about 2.1 or 2.2 times the mass of the sun. Okay, that's the limit. It's called the, the what is what was it called? TOV, T O V limit. Okay. And O stands for Oppenheimer. So Oppenheimer was involved in finding that threshold. If the neutron star okay, gets over that threshold, gravity is the ultimate winner and you have a black hole. So it's a very short video. Let's quantify the transition from white dwarf to neutron star to black hole. Suppose we have a dead star and an imaginary dial that lets us change its mass. We'll set the dial to one solar mass, the mass of our sun. This produces a white dwarf, a spinning sphere of white hot matter about the size of the Earth. As we increase the mass by turning the dial, gravity gets stronger, the white dwarf gets smaller, and it spins more quickly. Once we turn the dial to 1.39 solar masses, gravity is strong enough to combine electrons and protons to make neutrons and neutrinos. This value on the dial is called the chandra sekar limit, the dead star is now a neutron star. It shrinks down to a sphere with a radius of about 10 kilometers, and the spinning can be as fast as hundreds of times per second. If we move the dial further, gravity eventually becomes strong enough to break down the neutrons, and the neutron star collapses into a black hole. This point on the dial is called the tolman oppenheimer volkoff limit, and while its exact value is not known, it ranges from 1.5 to 3 solar masses. If you were to look at the ingredients of a neutron star, it wouldn't be 100% neutrons. The number one ingredient is definitely neutrons, but there are still some protons and electrons in there too. Because a rapidly spinning neutron star contains these charged particles, there will be a massive magnetic field. Just like on Earth, the magnetic field doesn't have to line up with the axis of rotation. Like a stellar lighthouse, the magnetic field sweeps across the sky, emitting regular bursts of electromagnetic radiation. Because of this pulsing signal, neutron stars are sometimes called pulsars. Neutron stars, like the neutron, were predicted to exist before they were observed. Almost as soon as a neutron was detected, astronomers Walter Bada and Fritz Zwicky predicted that a supernova could produce neutron stars. And in 1967, a pulsating neutron star was first observed. In the decades since, many more have been discovered. Let's quantify the transition. Okay, so I think it's a great video. And um, this is a Hoberman sphere. So just to show you that when the star is going to collapse, okay, it's going to reduce in size, it's going to spin faster, 
because angular momentum is conserved, right? So that's just a demo. You can expand this than the market. Its so the angular speed should increase. Gravity is winning. Boom. Do you see how crazy it's going? Slow. And sure enough, sure enough. it's one of the most uh, spectacular demonstrations, I think, of conservation so of angular momentum. So when gravity is winning, it's going to rotate very fast. Okay, so that's what's happening with a white dwarf, and even so with a neutron star. So now I have a very cool video. Uh, what is inside a neutron star? Uh, okay, very weird stuff. Neutron stars are one of the most extreme and violent things in the universe. Giant atomic nuclei only a few kilometers in diameter but as massive as stars. And they owe their existence to the death of something majestic. Stars exist because of a fragile balance. The mass of millions of billions of trillions of tons of hot plasma are being pulled inwards by gravity and squeeze material together with so much force that nuclei fuse. Hydrogen fuses into helium. This releases energy which pushes against gravity and tries to escape. As long as this balance exists, stars are pretty stable. Eventually, the hydrogen will be exhausted. Medium stars like our Sun go through a giant phase where they burn helium into carbon and oxygen before they eventually turn into white dwarfs. But in stars many times the mass of our Sun, things get interesting when the helium is exhausted. For a moment, the balance of pressure and radiation tips and gravity wins, squeezing the star tighter than before. The core burns hotter and faster, while the outer layers of the star swell by hundreds of times, fusing heavier and heavier elements. Carbon burns to neon in centuries, neon to oxygen in a year, oxygen to silicon in months, and silicon to iron in a day. And then, death. Iron is nuclear ash. It has no energy to give and cannot be fused. The fusion suddenly stops and the balance ends. Without the outward pressure from fusion, the core is crushed by the enormous weight of the star above it. What happens now is awesome and scary. Particles like electrons and protons really don't want to be near each other. But the pressure of the collapsing star is so great that electrons and protons fuse into neutrons, which then get squeezed together as tightly as in atomic nuclei. An iron ball the size of the Earth is squeezed into a ball of pure nuclear matter the size of a city. But not just the core, the whole star implodes, gravity pulling the outer layers in at 25% the speed of light. This implosion bounces off the iron core, producing a shock wave that explodes outwards and catapults the rest of the star into space. This is what we call a supernova explosion, and it will outshine entire galaxies. What remains of the star is now a neutron star. Its mass is around a million times the mass of the Earth, but compressed to an object about 25 kilometers wide. It's so dense that the mass of all living humans would fit into one cubic centimeter of neutron star matter. That's roughly a billion tons in a space the size of a sugar cube. Put another way, that's Mount Everest in a cup of coffee. From the outside, a neutron star is unbelievably extreme. Its gravity is the strongest outside black holes, and if it were any denser, it would become one. Light is bent around it, meaning you can see the front and parts of the back. Their surfaces reach a million degrees Celsius, compared to a measly 6,000 degrees for our Sun. OK, let's look inside a neutron star. Although these giant atomic nuclei are stars, in many ways they're also like planets with solid crusts over a liquid core. The crust is extremely hard. The outermost layers are made of iron left over from the supernova, squeezed together in a crystal lattice with a sea of electrons flowing through them. Going deeper, gravity squeezes nuclei closer together. We find fewer and fewer protons as most merge to neutrons. 
until we reach the base of the crust. Here, nuclei are squeezed together so hard that they start to touch. Protons and neutrons rearrange, making long cylinders or sheets, enormous nuclei with millions of protons and neutrons shaped like spaghetti and lasagna, which physicists call nuclear pasta. Nuclear pasta is so dense that it may be the strongest material in the universe, basically unbreakable. Lumps of pasta inside a neutron star can even make mountains, at most a few centimeters high, but many times as massive as the Himalayas. Eventually, beneath the pasta, we reach the core. We're not really sure what the properties of matter are when they're squeezed this hard. Protons and neutrons might dissolve into an ocean of quarks, a so-called quark-gluon plasma. Some of those quarks might turn into strange quarks, making a sort of strange matter with properties so extreme that we made a whole video about it. Or maybe they just stay protons and neutrons. No one knows for sure, and that's why we do science. That's all pretty heavy stuff, literally, so let's go back out into space. When neutron stars first collapse, they begin to spin very, very fast, like a ballerina pulling her arms in. Neutron stars are celestial ballerinas spinning many times per second. This creates pulses because their magnetic field creates a beam of radio waves which passes every time they spin. Do you see the pulses? Okay, so it's like a lighthouse, right? The beam is going toward us, away from us, right? So you're going to get a beep of uh, radio waves. These radio pulsars are the best known type of neutron star, about 2,000 are known of in the Milky Way. These magnetic fields are the strongest in the universe, a quadrillion times stronger than Earth's after they're born. They're called magnetars until they calm down a little. But the absolute best kind of neutron stars are friends with other neutron stars. By radiating away energy as gravitational waves, ripples in space-time, their orbits can decay and they can crash into and kill each other in a kilonova explosion that spews out a lot of their guts. When they do, the conditions become so extreme that for a moment, heavy nuclei are made again. It's not fusion putting nuclei together this time, but heavy neutron-rich matter falling apart and reassembling. Only very recently, we've learned that this is probably the origin of most of the heavy elements in the universe, like gold, uranium and platinum, and dozens more. So then now, two neutron stars collapse and become a black hole, dying yet again. Not only do stars have to die to create elements, they have to die twice. Over millions of years, these atoms will mix back into the galaxy, but some of them end up in a cloud which gravity pulls together to form stars and planets, repeating the cycle. Our solar system is one example, and the remains of those neutron stars that came before us are all around us. Our entire technological modern world was built out of the elements neutron stars made in eons past, sending these atoms on a 13 billion year journey to come together and make us and our world. And that's pretty cool. Until then. Okay, so it's quite fascinating. So at the end of the video, it, it could happen that you have two neutron stars in a binary system. Okay, so they're going to orbit each other, mass, center of mass very quickly. And if they merge, okay, you can make a new neutron star or you can make a black hole. When, when you have these kind of mergers, it's going to burp out gamma rays. Okay, it's called short, uh, short gamma rays burst. And what is interesting is that during the Cold War, you know, they were spying on each other, the Soviet Union and, and the US, okay? And they were detecting those bursts of gamma rays. So the, the US was worried that maybe the Soviet Union was trying to uh, attack with their fusion bomb. And they were ready to push the red button. Okay, it was at the time of Reagan, President Reagan. And, and then it turns out that those bursts of gamma rays were coming from space. So luckily, you know, <laughs> uh, we avoided the World War III. Uh, maybe not for long, but at least at the time. So he talked about when at the, at the very beginning, at the very beginning of the video, okay, he talked out 
when when the um, when the, the, the neutron star is first formed, okay, it's going to spin really very very quickly. So inside, you know, you still have protons. Okay, so when protons are moving or charged particles are moving, they're going to produce a magnetic field. Okay, so that's how our magnetic field is being produced inside the outer core. Okay, you have charged particles. Okay, so it could be ions, uh, iron, iron ions. Okay, so because they are moving, they produce a magnetic field. So that's why the neutron stars can have like crazy, crazy, crazy strong magnetic field. So in that case, they have a special name. They are called magnetar. Isn't that the name for a Pokemon, Magneta? Well, it seems, I think so, I'm not sure. So here you have two neutron stars uh, merging together, boom. And you have another neutron star, but in that case, it's a Magneta. So it means very, it's like a huge magnet, okay? Huge, 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 very strong magnetic field. Um, magneta. A high-energy outburst seen in April 2020 confirmed the surprising range of super-magnetized objects called magnetars. This blast of X-rays and gamma rays triggered instruments on several spacecraft. The eruption was over in the blink of an eye and originated from a galaxy about 11 million light-years away. Magnetars are part of the family of compact objects known as neutron stars, the crushed leftover cores of exploded stars. What makes magnetars special are their incredibly strong magnetic fields, up to 1,000 times stronger than a typical neutron star's. Sudden changes to this ultra-strong field are thought to drive brief, enormously powerful outbursts called giant flares. One giant flare in our own galaxy affected Earth's upper atmosphere from 28,000 light-years away. On April 15th, detectors on NASA's Fermi, SWIFT, Mars Odyssey, and WIND missions, as well as on the European Space Agency's Integral satellite, picked up a rapid surge of X-rays and gamma rays. Using the arrival times of the signal at different spacecraft, astronomers pinned the burst to NGC 253, a bright, nearby galaxy. From start to finish, the event lasted just 140 milliseconds, as fast as a finger snap. Astronomers see gamma-ray bursts, or GRBs, almost every day. We know that at least some of the shortest GRBs come from merging neutron stars more than 100 million light-years away. The April blast initially looked similar to these events, but a GRB located in our own galactic neighborhood should have appeared much brighter. As astronomers explored this new burst in detail, they found it looked less like a short GRB, and more like a magnetar giant flare. Astronomers have recorded two such flares inside our own galaxy, and a third in a satellite galaxy. All of these bursts displayed a spiky tail as they faded out. The spikes form as the flare's hotspot spins in and out of view like a lighthouse beam. Current instruments can't detect this feature in flares located at great distances. But other characteristics, such as their extremely fast rise in brightness, are unmatched by short GRBs. This fueled astronomers' growing suspicions that short GRBs associated with galaxies in our neighborhood might really be magnetar giant flares. Now, the precise localization of the 2020 event to the disk of the Sculptor Galaxy has unmasked them at last. Astronomers suspect that a few percent of observed short GRBs may in fact be giant flares, high-powered eruptions in our galactic backyard, produced by the strongest magnets in the cosmos. So Magneta, it's, it's only recently that they started to understand how it works. Um, okay, so what's happening here? Okay, so you can have two neutron star combining to each, with each other and you can get a neutron star or a black hole. So two neutron star orbiting their center of mass and they rip each other out.
So th this was done, okay, it's a numerical simulation based on real data observations. So one, one other thing that the reason why we can understand so much today, it's because of, you know, the, the computers advanced a lot. Um, and I had one more here. So they just combine together. You see there is a transfer of matter. Yeah. You have neutron star left and the other one can escape. So you have many scenarios. Uh, do I have anything on magneto? No. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. We talked about that already. And so one, one of the physicists who predicted neutron star is Fritz Zwicky. Uh, and we already talked about him. He also predicted dark matter. Okay, and he's seen, he observed many supernovae himself. So that was just after the neutron was discovered. In the 1930s, they discovered the neutron. Uh, I think the physicist was Shadwick, Shadwick, and he got the Nobel Prize for it. Okay, so the way he was able to observe dark matter, and dark matter is about 85% of all the universe. So it's stuff that will provide the glue, okay, that glue um, all the galaxies together. And uh, we don't know what it is. Okay, so the way he did that, he observed a group of galaxies inside what is called the, let's see, the coma, the coma cluster. So we, do you remember the universe, if you zoom out, looks like filaments, right? In, in those filaments, filaments, okay, you're going to have a lot of dark matter that glue all the clusters together, okay, all the super cluster together. In between, you have, as you see, it says void. So you have nothing, okay? So those filaments is like the cosmic web. That's what it's called. You see all those cluster glued together with dark matter. And remember, so it's a review. We, we are uh, uh, inside the Milky Way. The Milky Way belongs to the local group. The local group belongs okay, to a group of clusters. And that, that group of group is inside the Virgo supercluster. Okay? So we are in a local group. Okay, then you have, for example, the Virgo cluster with the black hole that they took picture of, and then you have other cluster. All that belong to a super cluster, which is called the Virgo super cluster. So Fritz Zwicky was observing here this super cluster, the coma super cluster. Inside that, you have the coma cluster. And what he was able to observe is that a group of galaxies. So galaxies are always moving relative to each other, right? Nothing is static, but they were moving faster than expected. Okay, so what makes things move is gravity pooling. Okay, so when he computed all the masses in that cluster of galaxies from, from the stars and from the gas and then from the dust, he could not explain why there was so much pool. Okay, the pool that make those galaxies go very fast. And that's when he predicted, he predicted uh, dark matter. Okay, so coma, so it's a beautiful cluster of galaxies. Okay, so all those galaxies are gonna move relative to each other, but when you look at their speed, it's too, too high, too large. Okay, and the only way you can explain this very high speed is because you have dark matter. We already talked about the bullet cluster. That was really the nail 
for the dark matter. So he predicted it, and I told you that he didn't have nice words to say about his colleague, so maybe he didn't help <laughs> with this uh, theory. But nevertheless, he was a genius, okay? Fritz Zwicky. Oh, I, I have also a website, so I can, uh, I, I think I will upload that in the canvas for those who are interested, curious about the universe, because it's super interesting. Okay, so you have this website here. Okay, so it's like a summary, summary what we talked about, but one of the pictures I found that was interesting. So here you have the cosmic web. Okay, you have the types of galaxies. So spiral galaxies are young galaxies like our Earth. You have the Milky Way, and here you have the review. Okay, so you have, remember, the local group. So we have the Milky Way. Here we have the Magellanic Clouds here orbiting the Milky Way, and you have other galaxies like Andromeda Galaxy. Remember, Andromeda Galaxy is supposed to collide with us. So that's for the local group. Okay, and then that local group here, that local group where we are belongs to the Virgo supercluster. And at the center of the Virgo supercluster, so it's a review, you have the Virgo cluster with a very famous black hole they took a picture of in 2019 and got the Nobel Prize. So of course, from our perspective, it seems we are at the center of that Virgo supercluster, but actually it's the Virgo cluster which is at the center. So just a review, you know, if you have an, inter an interview, you start to talk about that, it would be very impressive. Again, okay, so you have the Virgo supercluster with the Virgo cluster, the local group, and so forth and so on. And here you have the comma supercluster with the comma cluster. And you see here what the universe looks like. So, if, you, if I don't, and if you're interested, remind me if I don't, if I forget to post it. So in a million years from now, so about three billion years from now, you see Andromeda is gonna be very close to the earth. Okay, and uh, you will be able to see it in the sky. Well, that's, you, we won't be alive unless we find a way, I don't know, to save the software or something like this. Okay, and then as I told you, some of those neutron stars, okay, so if they have the right orientation, so they're going to emit jets, okay, jets of gamma rays, X-rays, and radio waves, and the radio waves can travel over a very long distance, so it can reach us, okay, so a pulsar, okay, it's a neutron star, but that will behave like a lighthouse. So that means the beam will go toward you, away from you. So it's going to go beep, 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 beep. So in 1967, so here, Jocelyn Bell, she was a graduate student, and her advisor had built a special radio telescope. Okay, so they were doing research. They didn't know at the time about pulsar. So just doing research, radio telescope, collecting radio wave from space. And she was able to detect those beep, 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 okay? The, the pulse had a period of 0 0.04 seconds. So what's funny about that is that at the beginning, they didn't understand that it was a pulsar, okay? They thought it was extraterrestrial life. So they called that pulsar, I think there is a question on the homework or final, the little green man. Okay, so I don't know why extraterrestrial life has have to be green and not yellow and orange or blue, but nevertheless, it's supposed to be green. So they call that the little green man. And they were about to publish a paper, okay, announcing everyone that they had found life from uh, in, in another part of the universe. And all of a sudden, they, they keep detecting those beep, 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 beep. So actually they realized that they had detected the first pulsar. 
And the sad story is that the advisor, okay, got the Nobel Prize and he didn't share the Nobel Prize with uh, his um, graduate student, which is totally unfair. She didn't take it badly. Okay, she had uh, actually a good spirit. She was, uh, she is British, and uh, she was now she she got many awards and she was knighted. Okay, so for example, Newton was knighted, so he became Sir Isaac Newton for all he did for the British government. So he was not knighted because he was. Uh, he discovered physics, quote unquote, but he was knighted because he went after counterfeiter, fake fake money, right? So she was knighted for all her accomplishments and she became Dame, D-A-M-E, because like a French name, Dame Jocelyn Bell. So anyway, she didn't get the Nobel Prize, which is uh, very sad because it's true. Her advisor had built a radio telescope who, uh, that will detect those pulsars, but Still, she, she was the one who, you know, worked on those data, okay? A Nobel Prize can be shared with three people. You can you can have at most three people. So you could share it. But of course, if you share it, it's less money. Okay, so it happened many times that uh, they didn't uh, want to share the Nobel Prize. Another example is the microwave cosmic background. Do you remember it was uh, detected by uh, two engineers? Um, what's his name? Robert. Okay, each time I want to remember something, I forgot Wilson. And so anyway, the, the two physicists, and they didn't share the Nobel Prize with the physicist who predicted the cosmic background. Okay, his name was George Gamow. Okay, so sometimes you know they hold on the money; they do, they don't want to share. So anyway. That's for the story. So that's a neutron star. And you see it's a ejected beam of radiations, including radio waves. And those radio waves can go, you know, through the dust and it won't be stopped and it will make it to, to the Earth, right? So let me show you what a neutron star looks like. Penzias. Pen Penzia? Penzia, I think the cosmic microwave back on. Okay, let me show you. You don't remember anyone? Mm. Okay, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. Okay, I remember Wilson, the other one was Penzias, and they didn't share with uh, George Gamo from Princeton University, and he is the one who predicted with other scientists um, the radiation, and he didn't share. So it happened also for the discovery of DNA, if you're interested. So anyway, uh, let me show you what uh, pulsar looks like. Neutron star, pulsar, pulsar, create a pulsar here. So it's gonna spin, you see, it, it behaves like a lighthouse, okay? So you have a beam of radio wave beeping towards you, okay? So it's gonna be, so it depends if, if it's now this way, um it's it's gonna work but if it's another way you know you're not going to get the beams so if it's spinning this way it depends if it's towards you or not but that's that's what it looks like a pulsar 1967. a teaspoon of these bad boys would weigh about four billion tons Astronomers have just discovered a pretty young pulsar, which seems to be the most powerful one ever observed. Pulsars are basically neutron stars that emit beams of electromagnetic radiation, and they point straight toward Earth. Neutron stars are some of the densest objects in the universe. They come after massive stars explode, so they're practically the collapsed cores of massive stars. Although these objects
sets most stars, about one and a half times, times the mass of our sun, sun. they typically they measure, measure about 20 kilometers across. across. A teaspoon, a teaspoon of these bad boys, boys would weigh about 4 billion, billion tons. I know, mind-blowing. Mind -blowing. We have a we good have understanding of how they form, but we have a lot to learn about their evolution. The newfound pulsar star is known as BT 1137-033. Astronomers in these names, but I don't blame them. There are just so many stars out there that you have to design codes for them so that they can keep track of them more easily. So, the new pulsar seems to be extremely energetic. Scientists say it appears it's about 10,000 times more energetic than the crab pulsar. And more surprising is that it has an even stronger magnetic field. It's so strong that no one is sure whether it belongs to another class of neutron stars, magnetars. Magnetars have the strongest magnetic fields in the universe. Their magnetic fields typically range from a thousand trillion times stronger than Earth's to somewhere between a hundred to a thousand times stronger than a pulsar's. If the newfound pulsar is instead of magnetar, this would mark the first time astronomers have caught a magnetar in the act of appearing. Astronomers found the new pulsar using data from the very large array sky survey, a seven-year project of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, which is conducting three full sky scans from the very large array, BLA, near Socorro, Mexico. When finished, it will have mapped about 80% of the sky over the course of three separate runs. Scientists first observed the pulsar in 2018. It lies in a dwarf galaxy about 400 million light years away. Because we observed this object again in 2019, 2020, and 2022, it's obvious that it isn't just a transient radio burst of some kind. Right now, the object appears to be a pulsar wind nebula, a neutron star that accelerates nearby charged particles at almost the speed of light. Wonder how it does that? Well, as the pulsar spins extremely fast, hundreds of times per second, its magnetic field and radiation beams sweep through the surrounding nebula, causing gas there to ionize and emit radio light. Another interesting thing is that the pulsar appears to be in its infancy, between 14 and 80 years old. Astronomers came to this conclusion because the pulsar wasn't seen in an earlier ELA sky survey made in 1998. This suggests that the object is one of the youngest neutron stars yet found. The finding was announced on June 15th at the 240th meeting of the American Astronomical Society in Pasadena, California. You can find the source link below. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. Okay. So it's a very fascinating object. And let's see if I have a neutron star crate. Did I? No, I did that. I did that. Okay, the only thing I miss is this one. This one is just a. It's boom. You can see the lighthouse effect, right? Boom. So that's how the first one was detected with a radio telescope okay don't don't space out i see people going on the phone okay it's just like a few more minutes bear with me okay uh let's say if i had something nova explosion in the binary i think i i show you everything i wanted to show you okay so next time we'll talk about black holes so remember there is no class on there is no class on friday thank you thank you <laughs>